everyone, and welcome back. This week I am sharing with you my villain origin story. Or, more accurately, I am sharing with you the design and construction of a 1920 suit coat that really feels like it should be part of one. Or at least in a villain's closet. So, before we get started though, this doesn't feel quite right. So give me just one second to see if I can fix that. Much better. So if you saw my previous video, you'll know that I am working on a 1920 capsule wardrobe for an upcoming trip. Now this is not only for the trip itself, but really is a bit of a wardrobe overhaul for myself as well. I've been trying to figure out what my style is, what I would really like it to be, and I realized that my dream job, which I know does not exist, is really to be Edna Mode, but for supervillains. So why don't I at least try to incorporate that a little more into my daily life? And this capsule wardrobe is the perfect opportunity for that. So of course, for both reasons, I am starting the entire thing with the quintessential black suit. Because what else does a villain need but a black suit? I specifically chose to go with a suit style from 1920 because this era for me is such a wonderful amalgamation of many different styles. You have the curvier and fuller skirted styles of the mid 19 teens transitioning away, but we aren't quite at the mid 1920s straight cut box style yet. There's still an accentuation to the waist, there's still some very interesting curves going on, and quite frankly, there's not really another era that quite copies this style again. So it's a really distinct and unusual style. Pair this with the general aesthetics of the era, and it really fits perfectly within the villain aesthetic. In fact, we very often see Art Deco, or Modern, used alongside of villains. It is dramatically different than the earlier Art Nouveau style of the turn of the century into the 19-teens, which is really based off of the natural ebb and flow of plants and flowers and vines, leaves, all of those very soft, natural, unpredictable elements. And instead, we move into a much more geometric style. It's not that it doesn't have curves and some more natural attributes, it's just more based off of rocks and mountains and hardscapes, because it's a much more logical, precise, and much more mathematical feel to design. It feels very thought out rather than emotional. So this is a style that we regularly see used over and over again when they want to elicit very cold, hard, logical, non-emotional feeling. And therefore it gets used in places like Gotham City or it gets used when it comes to villains' lairs or their cars. It is such a common era for the classic murder mystery as well. And if you're like me and you absolutely love that 1920s mystery aesthetic, you should definitely check out the sponsor of this week's video, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object game that follows our errant sleuth June in solving the mystery of her sister's murder and uncovering the family secrets, all set in the world of the Roaring Twenties and beautifully illustrated to capture the vibrancy of the era. Of course, June keeps getting caught up in exciting and perilous situations, propelling the plot forward. As you discover clues in each new place, the story unfolds, revealing mysterious characters, shocking secrets, and adventure. On top of all of this, you get to build up the island as you go along with gardens, stables, shops, and more. I've been a little bit obsessed with this game since I started it, as I found it perfect to pick up for a few minutes here and there throughout the day to take a break. It's so satisfying to complete each scene. Especially as I've been working on this 1920s wardrobe, it's just so easy to get pulled into the aesthetic. Wait, where is my camera remote? And the best part is that it's free to download. Just check out the link below to get started with your own adventure. And thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video and helping me find my camera remote. Again. So that is one of the many reasons that I have specifically chosen to center in on 1920. I was fortunate enough to find a few tailoring manuals for drafting up suits from this era. So I used a combination of a 1919 and a 1921 drafting pattern in order to come up with the precise style that I wanted to do. In fact, there's a whole Twitch live stream that I did comparing the two different drafting patterns that I used, sort of combining them in the end. And this particular style was something I was trying to achieve based off of fashion plates of the era 
there was an aesthetic I really wanted, and neither was quite right, but merging the two ended up perfectly. From there, I needed to figure out how to actually assemble it. The construction techniques of this era are apparently quite different than I expected. I was fortunate enough while I was perusing Etsy to come across a manual that had been digitized by Mrs. Depew, and she had that PDF up for sale. It's a tailoring manual for women's suits. I believe it was originally published in 1918 and updated in 1921, so it fits perfectly within my range. And though I did have to make quite a few changes to it, things that weren't quite the same as their particular jack design, adding in things like welted pockets or other structural details that didn't quite fit with what the manual explained. It still helped me to really understand how to get the shape of the era in ways that I had honestly never tried before. I did not expect some of the techniques that I found inside, which made it a very exciting process, but also a very lengthy one. There's a lot more effort, a lot more structure, a lot more handwork inside of this jacket than I originally intended, so that's one of the reasons why it is just the jacket for this video rather than the entire suit. There will be a skirt and trousers to match with this when time allows, but for right now the focus was on the jacket and the discovery of the construction techniques and patterning and styling of this era. So without further ado, let's get into figuring out the textiles, because that was definitely an adventure unto itself. For the main fabric, I chose to go with a wool satin. This was not originally my first choice, but I knew I wanted a black wool that had some luster to it. As for the lining, I wanted something that had a little bit of interest, a little bit of sass to it. So I ended up going with a striped silk that you'll get to see a little bit more of later. As for the interior portion, I'm using a linen chest canvas. This is not something I am overly fond of, as it has a lot of stretch on the bias, and that's generally not something I like to use for most tailored garments. However, this is meant to be a little bit of a lighter tailored piece, so I thought that'd be a good chance to try it out and see if it worked under these particular circumstances. Interestingly enough, the instructions called for a lot of things to be cut on the bias as it was, so it definitely gave it a much less structured appearance than I am used to. The very first part of dealing with any canvas like this, though, is doing up all the seams. The instructions had me do it with actual machine seams, pressing things open, but this stuff, a little too resistant in one of the directions. So I'm doing my typical method of overlapping and then working the seams down with a catch stitch. I find this to create way less bulk and... That's pretty important in the interior portions of a garment, especially dealing with a heavier canvas. The most interesting part of the entire interlining process for me though was this point. They had me put a very small circle of horsehair canvas at the bust point. This is to help with the curve that happens in that area. The curve is built into the jacket and into the canvas, hence why that seam has to be there. And this will help round that out and support it. The very first step for nearly every part of this process, as you will see from here on out, is pinning and then pasting it into place. So much easier once it's pasted, it's not going to move until we've stitched it properly in. The next layer is the horsehair canvas that sits on top of the shoulders and chest area. This only extends as far as that little circle in front and is cut short of all of the other seam allowances. This is really important because you don't want this jabbing into you in any place, and unless the edges are covered properly, it will. Then the instructions had me do a whole bunch of really interesting pad stitching. This is not a pattern I've ever used for pad stitching. It starts off with a spiral around that bust circle, and then it continues on in lines radiating outwards. This is a new shape. I really love how it turned out in the final format. It's not a shape that I'm going to want to use on a lot of my jackets, as I don't always put this much curve into the bust area in front. But if that is what I'm going for, this was a really effective way to do that. 
Moving on then to the collar, we're also going to be pad stitching that. The collar does have a seam down the middle because the under collar and the interfacing are done on the bias. Unlike the over collar, which is cut on the fold on the straight grain, the bias here will allow you to stretch and mold the collar shape so that way it holds really well to your neck. You can't just cut it on the bias because sometimes the warp stretch is different than the weft stretch and you need it to be symmetrical around the neck. So you have to put the seam in the back, then you can baste those two layers together and start pad stitching. For the particular instructions I was following, it had me pad stitch by machine down at the collar stand portion. So this was just row after row of machine stitches holding the two together. You can pad stitch this by hand as well, but I was trying to follow the instructions the best I could manage. The upper portion, however, is pad stitched. I like to make sure that I'm folding and curving the collar as I do this over my fingers to make sure that it does start to take on the final shape. The rest of it is done with pressing, and you can spray water on or steam it on, press with a hot iron over a tailor's ham to get the right curve and the right shape. It specifically had me press a pretty extreme curve into this collar, so we'll see how that turns out when I go to finally attach it and finish it. But first we have moved on to the body. I went ahead and stitched together all the front sections before I started to put in the pockets. I'm doing a welted pocket and I have a lot of extra reinforcement that I'm using here. Again, this is the point where I have to diverge from the instructions because they don't mention any pockets. For this, I'm using a beetled linen for support. I am not only putting in the pocket, but I'm also going to be doing some embroidery below it. So I want to make sure that everything is well reinforced. It's just a really narrow double welt, so I'm adding one piece on top, which will be the welting for both sides, making sure that everything is pinned and basted into place so that way it doesn't shift back and forth while I stitch on the machine. And I'll take it over and literally stitch an entire little box around where the opening needs to be. Actually cut the opening through all the layers, making a little V at the ends where the corners are. And then it's a process of ironing folds and pressing back seam allowances, depending on what sort of style you want. You can press open the seam allowances or you can press them all to one side. Just depends on whether you want the welt to be recessed, sit proud, or be fairly even with your fabric as to which way you press the seam allowance. I wanted my welt to be a little bit recessed, so both the body and the interfacing got folded back well as the seam allowance from the welt itself stayed sticking up into the welt and that actually works out perfectly because it gives me a very precise place to fold the welt over. It's still easier to get this perfect by hand basting it back and hand stitching stitch in the ditch with a spaced back stitch in this case. That allows me to get this much more precise and even. It's also pretty important that you cut open that welt as evenly as possible in order to make sure that the welts themselves will be really symmetrical. Once that's all into place, I decided to do the embroidery before I got into actually inserting the pocket bag. For this, I'm doing lines with arrows. Seems pretty popular and common for women's suits in this era. In fact, the instructions that I was following, though it didn't have pocket embroidery, does have a recommendation for embroidery on the sleeves. And it was a very similar design. So I ended up using that particular design for the sleeves, as you'll see, and mimicking a simpler version of it for the pocket openings. I ended up using a 72 over 44 and a 60 over 44 for the threads. Really loosely spun silk thread that I used on my 1914 goth outfit previously, and it has a really nice loft to it. Then I could start to put in the pocket bags. I'm just using a cotton sateen for this. It doesn't need to be anything particularly fancy. I did choose this because I wouldn't need to face it. It's the same color and a similar sheen to that of the coat, so if a little bit of pocketing shows behind the weld, it's not a big deal. Otherwise, I would be adding a scrap of fabric to that portion I'm pinning up now, so that way you wouldn't see the pocketing through the weld as it inevitably won't stay fully closed all the time. I'm pinning into a lot of places to make sure that everything lays flat. It's important to make sure that your pocketing is not warped 
and then I'm able to stitch in the ditch again on top to make sure that it is in place and reinforced. But the final reinforcement where the weight will actually hang is done by machine going up the edges, around the top, making sure to catch that interfacing layer and back down the other side. So that way the pocket bag is not pulling on the welt as much as it's pulling on the reinforced portion. With both pockets in, it is time to start adding the front interfacing. This is a little complex to get into place with something that is as curvy as it is. So I started with pinning the flat portion down in the skirt area and making sure that it was as smooth as possible there before I pinned a few key points in the shoulders. And then I was able to flip it over and work it on top of the tailor's ham, mimicking the curves of a body. This will make sure that I don't end up flipping it right side out and having a whole bunch of extra wrinkles and fabric where there shouldn't be later. This then gets basted into place with lots of rows of basting stitches going up to where the roll line for the lapel is. And then the edges are trimmed back so then we can start to anchor it down. The interfacing then gets catch stitched to the main body fabric and a tape is applied around all of the edges. Taylor's tape is a very essential part of this entire process. It makes sure that even if you've cut something on the bias or anything other than the straight, it's not going to stretch unless you want it to. You can even pull a little bit snug in certain areas that you want to curve in and hold a little closer to the body. In this case, they did have recommendations in the instructions to do so just below the button area, right around the waist. Once everything is stitched around the edges into place, so we have a good clean fold line, we can then attach the fronts to the back. This is my preferred method, so I'm not handling all of the fabric any more than I have to. You can go ahead and put the entire body together and then put the interfacing in, but this fabric definitely had a tendency to fray, so I wanted to give as much time without handling as possible. I need to finish up all of the internal layers. This includes the reinforcement of the skirt. There is a fair amount of curve to this skirt, so I had to play around with exactly how I wanted to deal with that in the interfacing. I cut it on the bias so I could stretch it and press a curve into it, but it wasn't enough, which meant that I either had to seam it in multiple pieces, cut little darts into it, didn't want to gather it up because that's just too much bulk. I could cut it shorter, but it would have to only be a couple of inches deep. And I'm doing a fairly full skirt that I feel like it needs support. If I had a heavier fabric, I wouldn't worry about it as much. The instructions didn't tell me to do this. They just wanted a tiny little strip of calico at the bottom. So I'm altering that for a fuller style of skirt than what the instructions originally called for. I chose to go with the dart system and just catch stitching everything into place to get the curve correct around the bottom. And it will also be caught into place at the side back and center back seams and with some of the pocket reinforcement to make sure that it's not going to slump over time and eventually become a puddle at the bottom of the hem. Then it is time to start adding in the front facing. This is machine stitched very close to where the tailor's tape is around the edges. And then we're able to turn back the facing. If you have a lot of seam allowance here, you'll definitely want to cut back that seam allowance. I was already operating with only a quarter of an inch, so there wasn't exactly much to cut back any further. That can then get flipped right side out, the corners very carefully folded, so that way they aren't bulked up. Everything basted into place, which makes the process of ironing the edges really flat much easier. You want to make sure that they're not rolling one way or the other. The hem then can also be basted up and into place. And it was at this point I again decided to deviate a little bit. I didn't like the fact that it was gapping when I tried it on around the neck area just a little bit. It wasn't a lot, but I was worried it was going to stretch over time as both the canvas and the fabric is technically on the bias there. So I added tailor's tape to the roll line of the collar as well. Then it was time to get back to the collar itself. I folded up and stitched back the seam allowance for the bottom of the collar because it is going to be hand stitched on. And once we pin that into place, it can then just get very careful and tiny whipping stitches to hold that down to the neck.
it has me, thankfully, stitch a little bias strip of calico over the edges of the horse hair that will be exposed. There is a little bit more structure going into this interior first, so it will cover some of that, but not all. So this is the padding portion, and I honestly was a little bit surprised that padding was still a common thing in this era. It told me to do at least five layers. I think my wadding though is a little bit heavier than theirs was. I ended up with four and frankly I think that I probably could have done three and been just fine. The whole thing then gets pad stitched together to a layer of calico before it gets applied. It goes up the back shoulder area and down around the underarm and ends in the front a few inches short of the shoulder seam. This helps with really establishing the preferred shape of this era, which like I said before is surprisingly curvy considering where it's headed in the next few years. But this padding really helps to hold those sides in place, make sure that they aren't going to wrinkle up, make sure that you get the right curves, and accentuates the waist really beautifully. I am not actually using buttons and buttonholes to fasten this particular jacket. I'm basing it off of an image where it looks like it must be hooked in the front. So I'm inserting a hook and eye in through the seam. It makes the hook and eye nearly invisible no matter which way you look at it. With all of that in place, it's time to tack down the front facings and the collar, stitching those together up at the neckline very carefully with a slip stitch by hand and essentially permanently basting the front facing down to the canvas the whole way around the body. Same thing goes with the hem as well. Then it is time to move on to the sleeves. They're going to get a similar treatment to the hem of the skirt with a bias strip of interfacing that is pressed into a curve. I definitely made sure to have a decent width to this because again I'm going to be putting some embroidery there. This particular embroidery design, like I said, is in the book as a recommendation. So I'm just going through and doing the same process that I did on the pockets, a backstitch in a very heavy silk thread in order to make sure that it feels weighty and obvious without having to go through a lot of really tedious satin stitches. Once we have the bottom portion of the sleeve taken care of, it's time to move back up to the top. Here I'm putting in a gathering thread along the area that we need eased in. I'm not gathering this in the sense that it's going to be roughly and wrinkly. We're going to take it over to the iron, smooth it out as much as I absolutely have to in order to make sure that as I press it I won't end up with any creases or distinct gather marks, and we're shrinking it down. This is not something you can do with all fabrics, it really does require something like a wool that can be molded and shaped by heat and damp. After that we can start to add in the lining. I'm just using the same cotton sateen for this, no reason to put the really expensive stuff in the sleeves where you won't see it. The lining is attached with really long stitches to the main sleeve along that front seam. This is a permanent basting because that will help keep things from twisting and shifting as you put on the sleeve every single time. Basting then three times around the sleeve at the top, the middle, and the bottom to hold everything into place before I am able to stitch the bottom portion of the lining to the hem of the sleeve 
This basting is really necessary to do throughout the entire garment, and it is incredibly necessary to do here when we are setting the sleeves. This took a little bit of time for me to get the right shape and set for the sleeves, trying it off and on, but baste it into place once you think it is correct. Don't stitch it, baste it. Then check. You're going to save yourself so much time with the seam ripper. Once it's correct, then you can go ahead and machine stitch it or hand stitch it, however you want to. And our final step of setting the sleeves is to add a little bit of wadding to the sleeve head. Again, it said four layers. I'm just going with two, one piece folded in half, and it is just running stitched to the seam allowance. Interestingly enough, for the seam allowance, they did tell me to actually iron it towards the body rather than towards the sleeve, as they put it, so the sleeve feels like it's set into the coat rather than on top of. This is a method that I've seen on a lot of older styles of coats, but I didn't realize they were still using it for women's wear in this era. Next, it's on to the lining. The whole thing can get machined together, and then we will start to set it into place. I like to start setting my lining in the center back, make sure that everything is symmetrically done, starting up at that back neckline, working my way down to the waist and across from there. You always want to leave a little bit of extra seam allowance where the facing and the lining meet. You definitely don't want your lining pulled way too tight. It's going to create wrinkles in the exterior of the garment, nor do you want it way too loose because then you've got extra bulk wrinkling up inside. So you want to give yourself some extra leeway there just to make sure that you get it as smooth as possible inside. And then, as always, baste everything into place. Then you can go slip stitching around all of the edges of the lining to catch it down to the facings, the collar, and the hem. Once that is secure, we can stitch the sleeve lining to just the body lining. I'm not going through all the layers. Then it is time to remove all the basting stitches. It actually took me over an hour to do that, but it is worth it. That is also why you use basting thread instead of regular thread. It's much easier to remove in the end. The final step, though, is to attach the buttons, a pair of antique jet buttons that came out of my collection. Mm -hmm. 